ABC News anchor Diane Sawyer is cool, confident, and accomplished when you see her Thursday nights on Primetime Live. And that's just the way she is off camera, too. But there's a lot more. Take a look. Are you all ready? Mary? Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> I'm so glad you're doing this instead of me. I have to tell you. Usually it's you asking the questions. That's right. That's right. Sitting there. If she was distracted about doing an interview just before air last December, Diane Sawyer didn't show it as we sat in an ABC conference room. On the way to the studio, her easygoing manner continued. Oh, Rick! Let's look at Rick because Rick. No, we don't want to do this. This is the man who primed you with all this those nasty Rick. questions. This is Rick. He right? gave us the nasty questions. You want to questions. see? I can make this real unusable so nice right now. Watch how unusable I make this. Did she tell you the truth about how she really gets these interviews? <laughs> Has she told you about the payoffs? Has she told you about this? Has she told you about the way she lives her life? If you are surprised Diane Sawyer has a good sense of humor, you may also be surprised to know that she reads a lot and even borrows a definition of happiness from a favorite 19th century author, Henry James. It was in a book called Portrait of a Lady, and I remember reading it and just feeling one of those electroshock experiences of recognition. And he said, here's my idea of happiness. It's being in a carriage on a dark night racing down a highway toward an unknown destination. <laughs> Prime time. Now from Little Rock, Arkansas, Diane Sawyer. Good evening from Little Rock and the front yard of history. Sam For now, right. that carriage ride rests at ABC News. And those who've watched Diane Sawyer's career say she's been living James's definition of happiness to the hilt. Even in high school in Louisville, Kentucky, Sawyer was socially and academically accomplished. But she also recalls being a loner, spending lots of time reading the kind of stuff that made her what she calls boringly serious. She lived in the shadow of an outgoing older sister, and it was largely because her sister did, Diane Sawyer entered the Junior Miss Pageant in her senior year. In 1963, she won the national crown. And current feminism aside, that provided a scholarship for an Ivy League education and the kind of poise and confidence that would serve her well under the hot glare of TV lights. Let's go back a little bit. I remember when you were the weather girl at WLKY, Channel 32 in yes. Louisville, Kentucky. The world's worst weather girl. Very possibly the worst Why in history. Why did you say that? Oh, I was a disaster. Do you remember? Yes. Wasn't I awful? Now, come on. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I had no idea what was I was doing. I was bored to death. I knew nothing about weather. All I wanted to do was to do news and be out reporting stories and standing there in front of that map. And I was always hoping to think of creative ways to sort of sauce it up and make it a little more irreverent. And of course, they were humiliating and embarrassing. But not for long. She eventually became a reporter. And then in 1970, she headed to Washington for what she calls an intellectual vitamin. She landed a job as an assistant in the White House press office and eventually became staff assistant to President Richard Nixon. That move would be a double-edged sword in Sawyer's future. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. What she stayed with it through the Watergate scandal and then spent four more years with the ex-president researching his book. Her reason, she says, was loyalty, not ideology. Did you ever tell Mr. Nixon the truth? Well, I did. I tried to say things about writing the book. And we argued about things, and in the end, he didn't go with my advice. And in the end, I think he was probably right in purely political terms. I mean, when the book was finished, Sawyer wanted to get back into broadcasting and headed for her hometown. And I auditioned, and I remember that afterwards the director told me that he thought I was not polished enough and would never really have a career in television. <laughs> I enjoy being able to be on. Just a little bitty, bitty, bitty bit. I th we were talking about polished enough. I don't know what polished enough means except hairspray. And when I look back at it, I do think I was deeply deficient in hairspray, and still am for that matter. This is the CBS Evening News. She loves that story because if a Louisville news director thought she lacked a certain panache, CBS News didn't think so. Executives hired the relatively inexperienced reporter to the network's Washington bureau. But if news management felt confident about the government PR flack reporting the news, colleagues did not.
Among others, Dan Rather and Robert Pierpoint told her pointedly that she lacked credibility. But that was rough in the beginning. Of course, it was about something different. It wasn't just about being new, and it wasn't even about being female. And it wasn't even about being inexperienced, which I, I was, and, and recognized that it was a fluke that I was there at all. It was about having worked for Richard Nixon. And I was in the ambivalent position of understanding why they felt they felt th that way. So that when they come to me and say, we didn't think you should have been hired, I would say, oh, yes, I know just what you mean. <laughs> so that it was very complicated for me. At the same time, I would go in and close the door and my lower lip would tremble a little bit at the end of the day. The worst part, you know, was you'd walk in the room and the conversation would stop dead. And they would all, oh, hi. And you knew that. And there were some things in the press in columns where people had talked about how unhappy they was. I was there. It was hard. And then this wonderful producer came over to me. Uh, and I will love her for the rest of my life for it. And she came over to me and she said, I want you to know two things. First thing is, the first week that I was here, I threw up every day into the <laughs> wastebasket because I was so nervous and upset with the way I was treated. And the second thing is, you're going to be just fine. It was all she needed. Sawyer's career I'm took really off sick. until she eventually entered the all-male circle of 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes lasted five years. She has not elaborated, but press accounts say when Sawyer wanted more at CBS, the network didn't listen. So she walked across the street to ABC. And by that time, the girl who covered the news had become a cover girl. When she agreed to a profile for trendy Vanity Fair magazine, complete with fashion model photographs, she heard lots of complaints. Tradition-bound colleagues were not amused. CBS's Mike Wallace reportedly told her that it was distracting, if not detracting. She says she did it for fun, that it never occurred to her that she couldn't wear an evening gown on occasion and do her job well. Her hands here. Don't talk about her. For the past three years, she's reported Prime Time Live, co-anchoring with Sam Donaldson. It's 9 in the morning, and 24 children are being watched by just one woman. Four times. The program got off to a rocky start, but eventually it earned a respectable and successful niche in ABC's lineup. Sawyer's persistence and hard work is credited with some of that success. I think when I first came here, I was averaging about 22 stories a year at 60 Minutes. The first year I came here, I think I did 53. Her reports on unsanitary daycare conditions, neglected veterans' hospitals, racism, and deadbeat dads earned the production team numerous national awards and forced, in some cases, change. I've got some quotes that I love to go over with you. As an interviewer, you said you'd rather be smart than tough. Why? Because... The most interesting moments in an interview don't come from bullying someone. You bully, they resist. That's just an isometric exercise. The most interesting moments always come from having given this fact and given this fact and then this fact and this fact and then gradually they realize that they are cornered by facts. As a reporter, I'm, I can think of stories where I go, Ooh, if I could do that over again. Stories that have been an embarrassment, stories you say, I, I can't believe I put that junk on the air. Is there <laughs> anything in your past that you could look at and say, gee, I wish I could do that one over again? Oh, boy. I really don't think of stories because there, there's enough of a, um, I guess I have enough of a, of a, of a checklist of people that we run through on stories that the worst ones don't tend to get on the air. But I do think expressions are idiotic questions. Like what? I can't think of it. <laughs> I can't think of a single one so mortifying I've undoubtedly suppressed them. Don't be looks, don't be expressions on the, your face. I mean, aren't you always amazed that when you're sitting and talking with someone, the way you tend to Mm -hmm. the, the expressions you get in your face, and where do they come from? People, and they'd go. <laughs> <laughs> that look was intended. She tells stories on herself, isn't afraid to appear in glasses, and admits to riding an emotional roller coaster after deciding to cut her hair. 
it never dawned on me until it was lying on the floor that maybe someone, when I walked into the office the next day, was going to shriek, as indeed they did. I was so nervous about it, and this goes back to some... You know this is a primal thing about women and hair in life, if not in America, that I was, I was so afraid about it, I called my friend here, a woman who is our uh, the second in command here, and I made her meet me out on the street in the dark at night. <laughs> and I got out of the car and I stood there in the middle of the street like this and let her sort of judge it. And then I climbed back in the car and raced off again. I was terrified. One thing I read about you that surprised me, you described yourself as a dingbat. Oh, I am. I don't, I, there are at least uh, two people in this room who can confirm. How are you a dingbat? Um, I, I get very concentrated on my, my work. In the work I'm not, I always stay organized in my mind. But you were looking at a person. First of all, I'm very nearsighted, as we know. So I, I have an inclination to walk into walls and sort of, if you don't, any number of days I've got up in the morning and I've worn two different pairs of shoes. I, an old friend of mine and I were reminiscing about it the other night. She came to town when I was during the Junior Miss pageant and I came back to give away my crown. And uh, give away my crown, such an odd thing to say. Um, <laughs> but I, there I'm all dressed up in my crown, and those days we had scepters, and we had sashes, and I'm all dressed up. And this sweet woman who was in her 90s asked if I could take her to the ladies' room. And so I, she's one of the judges, and we totter out, the two of us, and we're in this big stadium, and I take her into the ladies' room. And I notice that when we go into the ladies' room, there are people sort of scurrying you might say I'm scurrying frantically in all directions, and I hear the sound of sort of shocked zipping, if you will, everywhere around. And of course, because I can't see very well, I've walked her into the men's room in a coliseum <laughs> with an entire row of men sort of standing there, and me and my tiara and my scepter, and I'm sort of looking around <laughs> and trying to figure out where I have her. <laughs> That's the story of my life. And what a life. The 47-year-old newswoman is married to film director Mike Nichols and doesn't plan any children. And somehow I think Diane would still look good tripping over her feet or even standing squint-eyed in the men's bathroom. <laughs>